It is good to see you here. The last couple of weeks have been a real blessing to me, and uh, just great to see you here. For those uh, in the fellowship hall, uh, thank you for being here, and for those watching online, uh, thank you for joining us. In our world today, it seems everywhere you turn, there's a reason to be sad. It seems like the weight of this world has no end. And for us as followers of Jesus Christ, when we see the fallenness of this world, uh, we in a sense feel that most keenly because we know what God created our world to be. So we look around and there's sadness. But in our own lives, living in a fallen world, there are things that cause us sadness. And I want to ask you as we begin today, uh, how are you doing with the feeling of sadness? Maybe you're here today and you're sad because you once had a good relationship with a friend and now it's strained or that friendship is over. Uh, maybe it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend and now uh, you don't have that, that special someone. Maybe it's a loved one and you've lost that loved one. Maybe it's your health and you used to have good health and now you don't. Or maybe it's a job. Your job used to be good or you had a good job and now you don't. Um, you used to have um, uh, your independence and now you're older and you can't even drive a car and you have to depend on people. You had these dreams and now you don't. Sadness is that feeling that God gives to us in these moments of loss. We have something, we've lost it, we feel sad. Now, for all of us, we struggle from time to time with sadness, but sadness can overtake us. As we begin today, I want to remind each of us that being sad is okay. If you recall, in this series, God gave us feelings, and it's okay to feel them, but we're aware that those feelings can take us somewhere. They can take us away from God and away from people, or those feelings, we can move towards God and towards people. And the big idea of this series is that if we are going to be who God created us to be, if we're going to be close to God and close to people, if we're going to be spiritually mature, we have to learn to be emotionally mature. Uh, we cannot remain uh, emotionally immature. We've got to learn to handle our emotions. And so today, we're talking about this emotion of sadness. What do we do with sadness? What does God want me to do with my sadness? So is everybody sad this morning? Okay, if you're not, just hold on. Soon you will be. What do you do with that feeling of sadness. And what we're going to do today is we're going to look at David, and he experienced that unpleasant emotion. Oh, we like the good emotions, but that unpleasant emotion, he experienced that. And um, we're going to be looking at a psalm that he wrote about his time in a cave. Now, again, uh, when it, uh, we talk about the psalms, the 150 psalms, uh, we can say there are three different categories of psalms. So as you read the psalms, you're aware that there are praise psalms. Oh God, I praise you because you are so uh, holy. You are, you are my creator. You're so great. And then there are thanksgiving psalms. God, I thank you for answering this prayer. God, I thank you for providing that. And then there are lament psalms or complaint psalms. God, why is this happening? How long is this going to be? And uh, today we're looking at one of those complaint psalms. David wrote about half of the psalms, and eight of them are connected to his time when he was on the run from King Saul. And the psalm today that we're looking at was either written in one of the caves of Adullam, uh, in Israel or uh, one of the caves uh, in Ein Gedi. So one of those two, for Samuel 22 or for Samuel 24, we're not quite sure. But in this psalm, we find David sad. And sadness has started to overtake him. But that's not the end of the story. And for you, you may be in a cave of sadness but that's not the end of your story. Today, may you learn that you can acknowledge your sadness as you go through life, but at the same time, you can experience joy. And that's what God wants for each of us. So I invite you, if you have a Bible, to turn to Psalm 142. 
And I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation today. Typically, we use the New, New International Version, but from time to time, we use another version. So New Living Translation, I'm going to begin in verses 1 and 2. And we're looking at David in a cave, and he is sad. David writes this, I cry out to the Lord, I plead for the Lord's mercy, I pour out my complaints before him and tell him all my troubles. So this is not a casual prayer. Oh Lord, thank you for this day. Please lead me and guide me. I hope the Leafs win tonight. Please help them to win. This is not a casual prayer. This is, Lord, I cry out, I plead, I pour out, I tell you all my complaints, all my troubles. David is at the end of his rope. David is telling God exactly how he feels. Uh, in this psalm, uh, the title, the superscription, talks about when he's in the cave. It's when he's in the cave. And he is just in this cave. He's just laying it out towards God. Now, why is David so emotional? Why is he so sad? Well, if we roll the videotape back in David's story, when he was young, it seemed like he had it all. He did have it all. His plate was full. When he was probably 13 or 14, he comes home one day from looking after the sheep. Uh, this is in the land of Israel 3,000 years ago. He comes home, and there at his home was the prophet Samuel, the 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 king, the first king, uh, King Saul, had the most authority in the land, but the prophet Samuel had the second most. And Samuel was there because God had called Samuel to go to the house of Jesse and to anoint this coming leader, this one that would have influence, and God's favor would be on him, and God would use him. And so David comes home that day, but none of his older brothers are anointed. Samuel comes over and anoints David with the oil. You're the next one. How many of you have older brothers? Okay, you're a younger brother. Is this not your dream, right? Not you, not you. It's me. David's going to have influence. God's going to use David in a special way. After that, a little later in his teens, he kills a lion, he kills a bear, and then he kills a giant. Who kills a giant? Who kills a leader? Or not a leader, a warrior? David did. And overnight, he becomes a hero. People hear throughout the land of Israel about David. In fact, David gets to go to the palace with King Saul. And King Saul um, likes David and gives David, in time, more and more responsibility. And David is a great military hero. And David is given his daughter's hand, King Saul's daughter's hand, Michael, in marriage. So he's got a wife. And Jonathan, King Saul's son, is David's closest friend. And so here is David for seven years years in the palace and his plate is full he's got it all but king saul being a leader like many leaders in our world today becomes paranoid that he's losing his power and he'll do anything to keep his power so he tries to kill david and david has to flee from the palace and for eight nine even up to ten years he is running from cave to cave for his life because King Saul's out to get him. And if you've ever been in the caves, in the, in the wilderness, in the, uh, this barren landscape in Israel, it's not fun. You, you, you see it and you're like, I wouldn't want to live here for a day. And for eight, nine, ten years, David is on the run. He had this and now it's gone. No close friend, no wife. In fact, his wife was given by the King Saul to another man. No palace, no influence, no affluence. All he has, all he sees is the cave. And so he cries out to God. And so often when we find ourselves in a bad place, we can become bitter. And David is bitter. He's in a sense that he's not complaining about God, but he's complaining to God. And if you read some of the other psalms connected to this time, it's like, why God? How come? And David is bitter. But not only is he bitter in the cave, but he's hopeless. He feels hopeless. Verse 3, when I am overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. Wherever I go, my enemies have set traps for me. I'm overwhelmed. I'm weary, God. I'm worn. I'm worn out. 
My enemies, they're just, they're relentless. And notice he says, wherever I go, my enemies have set traps for me. Even if I get away this time, there's going to be another trap and another trap. This is the story of my life. It's hopeless. There's no light at the end of the tunnel, at the, inside the cave. It's just, he's hopeless. Also, he's lonely. Verse 4, I look for someone to come and help me, but no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. Now, David, we know, has at least 400 men who are with him, loyal to him, but he still feels hopeless. When you're in a cave and all you can see are the walls, your emotions can go all over the place. And David is bitter and hopeless and lonely. Sadness is overtaking him. And he's looking at the past. He had all of this. He's looking at the present. He's lost it all. And he's sad. Before we continue with David's psalm and look how he moves from a past present perspective, woe is me, to a present future perspective, turning to God. Before we look at that, I want to pause just for a moment and talk about sadness here at Woodside. At Woodside, we aspire as a church to be a safe place for sad people. There is some sadness that's so intense, so deep, that needs to be respected. One uh, woman who's a Christian author shares about the time that she went to a choir retreat. retreat. She was in the choir at a church, and this retreat was three months after uh, she buried her daughter. And she, at this conference, said, at this retreat, said to a couple close friends, I'm not sinking into depression. I haven't lost my faith. I'm just sad, and I need you to let me be sad. When people experience things in our church family, we need to let them be sad rather than trying to fix them, trying to make them feel better, trying to speed up the healing process. And we all at times have experiences like that and we need to let others let us be sad. We need us, we're called to companionship, we're called to praying for one another. We're called to helping one another, making a meal or, or taking care of the kids for a little while or, or, or some other way that we can provide that practical help. But we're letting people be sad. But at the same time, we as a church aspire to bring the truth about Jesus, the truth about the gospel, to bear on untruths and misunderstandings of Scripture. We want to bring the truth of God, the hope of God, into the cave, into the sadness. Now, we don't do it right away. Sometimes we don't say anything. But if someone is stuck in a cave, you're stuck in the cave and you're hopeless, you're bitter and lonely, someone that really loves you will gently, at the right time, try to get your focus back on God. That God and his truths are worthy of our trust. You see, when we're in a cave... That's when we ask significant questions, right? If a relationship is broken, if a lost one is, is lo- a loved one is lost, if a job is lost, that's when we start to ask the questions. It's one thing when things are going well to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It's another thing to say it when you're going through something that's not good. Is the Lord really my shepherd? Does he really care about me? Is he really looking after me? I shall not want. Is is he really what I want? Like, significant questions are asked when we find ourselves in a cave. And really, it's uh, those, those times that we're forced to swim from the shallow end of the theological pool, what we know about God, to swim to the deep end, to the deeper things of God. Where we seek God in our pain, we're trying to figure out, God, who are you, what you're doing? And so we turn to him, turn to his word. But some people, because of untruths and mistaken notions, step out of the pool. I tried this Christianity thing. It didn't work. I'm done. Don't talk to me about church. Don't talk to me about God. I don't want to hear it. And they step out of the pool. As a church family, we are called to be looking at people, one another, giving space to be sad. But if someone is going down that road to despair, no hope, gently we're saying, no, here's 
the truth. At Woodside, we are not led by our emotions. We're in a culture that says that every day. Be led by your emotions. We're to feel deeply, uh, and there's an upside to feeling deeply because we can become more empathetic with people, more compassionate towards people. But there's a downside, and we have to be aware that our emotions can't always be trusted. Sometimes they exaggerate things. Sometimes they can be downright liars. They can tell us lies about our circumstances, about our future, about ourselves, about God, and they can lead us down to the path of despair. So David is heading down that path, crying out to God, God, in a sense, where are you? I've lost it all. Don't you care? And in the midst of that cave, looking at those walls, he moves from a present past perspective to a present future perspective. Verse 5. Then I pray to you, O Lord, I say, you are my place of refuge. You are all I really want in life. He brings the truth. Wait a second, God. You're my safety, you're my shelter, you're my place of refuge. Friends, I want to ask you, is God your place of refuge? As you journey through life and things hit you in this fallen world, one thing sometimes after another, are you saying, the Lord is my safety? He's ultimately got me in his hands. He's my shelter, my refuge. And then, David says, You are all I really want in life. Some translations, the more literal translation is, you are my portion in the land of the living. You're my portion, my inheritance. You're my prize. You're all I really want. In David's mind, very familiar that when um, Moses, just after Moses, the people came into the land of Canaan, uh, the 12 tribes, they were each given a portion of the land, but there was one tribe that didn't receive a portion, that was the Levites, and they were to lead the worship, and God was their portion. And so David is saying, my portion, my inheritance, my riches, my prize is not anything in this world. It's you, Lord. You're my refuge. You're my portion. You're all I want. Verse 6, hear my cry, for I am very low. Rescue me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. We may not have people chasing us, enemies, but with circumstances, we can feel like they just, they're relentless, and we can feel very low. We're in a bad place, a place that we never ever thought we'd be, just like David. He never thought he'd be there. He was anointed to be the, a leader, to, to have influence. And here he finds himself in this cave. He's very low. And he's saying, this is too strong for me. These persecutors, this, this whole situation. And then verse 7, bring me out of prison so I can thank you. God set me free from this cave. And then... He says this at the end of the psalm. He begins crying out to God, and at the end, he puts his hope and his trust and his faith once again in God. He says, the godly will crowd around me, for you are good to me. David in the cave moves to a present future view. He looks ahead to the time when he'll be with the people of God and they'll be praising him. The godly will crowd around me. Oh, Lord, you are good to me. By faith, David was saying, God, this cave is not the end of my story. God, you promised me, you promised me that I would be used, that your favor would be on me, oh, God. And David, even though circumstances hadn't changed, he looked ahead expecting God to intervene and to work. If you, I want to say to you, if you're a follower of Jesus, whatever you are going through, you can look ahead to the promises that Jesus has made to you, that you're going to see him face to face, that you're going to be a place where there's no more sorrow, no more weeping, nothing like that, because there's no sin. And so you get to go through life, we get to go through life looking ahead with Jesus as the reason for our hope and our trust. You know, if I wasn't a Christian, if you weren't a Christian and you were in a cave, what's your hope? What are you looking forward to? 
this pain is so great, oh, I'm just looking forward to that vacation to get away for a week or two weeks. Or oh, I'm in this cave and I just gotta smoke some more weed, that's all I need to numb the pain. Or I gotta drink, or I have to pour myself into my job so I don't think about my sadness. There's no hope apart from Jesus. He's the only one that was in a grave, dead, and three days later, rose to life. He's the only one that conquered the grave. And he needs to be your focus, your hope, your treasure, that you're saying as you go through life, Jesus, you are my refuge. Jesus, you are my portion. You're all I really want in life. That you bring to mind truths in your sorrow. Like David, you need to remind yourself, God hears the cries of my heart, even in this cave. Like David, God knows what I am going through. Like David, God will keep his promises and deliver me. Even though it hasn't happened yet, even though I can't see it, that your hope is in Jesus. It doesn't mean, it doesn't negate your pain and your sorrow, but you're looking ahead to him. Parents, can I encourage you to, to teach your children to lament that they will feel sadness, don't avoid this unpleasant feeling in their life, don't ignore it, but teach them to lament. Teach them, encourage them to tell Jesus exactly how they feel. Encourage them to ask Jesus for help and encourage them to trust Jesus. So for example, your child loses a best friend, moves away, and your child is sad. Let's tell Jesus how you feel and you help them. And then Let's ask Jesus to help you find a new friend or that you can be a friend to someone. And let's pray to Jesus and trust him. He's our closest friend. So you're teaching your child to move through their pain to that place of hope, of joy. Jesus, who is our treasure, who is our portion, said this in Matthew chapter 13, Verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. The kingdom of heaven, God, his reign, that he's in control, his presence, that someone finds that and in their joy sells all they have and say, I'm buying this field because I want that. Friends, when you understand who Jesus is, his glory, his greatness, his goodness, when you understand that, everything in the world pales and he's your treasure, he's your portion. And I want to say this to our young people, um, if you're like me, in my 20s and 30s, um, I, I, I really like the promises of God, I really like the blessings of God. But as I've gotten older, God himself is my treasure, not his promises. God himself is my treasure, not his blessings. Yeah, if this happens or that happens. But as you get to know more of who Jesus is, the more you're like, you're all I want. Yes, there's other things, but you're the most important thing in my life. And Jesus says, when you understand the kingdom of God, who he is, and all that awaits you in your joy. He becomes your treasure. He'll say this then a little later to his followers in John chapter 16 and verses 20 through 22. He says to, to his disciples, I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn over what is going to happen to me, but the world re re will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful joy. It will be like a woman suffering the pains of labor. When her child is born, her anguish gives way to joy because she has brought a new baby into the world. So you have sorrow, notice this, so you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Then you will rejoice and no one can rob you of that joy. What's Jesus doing there? He's teaching his followers to have that present future perspective as they go through life. Yes, you have sorrow now. Yes, I'm going to die on the cross, but I'm going to see you again. Look ahead to that day. And Peter did see the risen Jesus. And I wonder if that was on his mind when he wrote um, the letter of 1 Peter. 
He's writing 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, and he's writing to some Christians in modern-day Turkey and in that area who are experiencing great sorrow because they're not worshiping the Roman gods. They're not going to the festivities where there's immorality and all these things. They're, they're being faithful to Jesus, and as a result, they were being um, lied about. They were being persecuted. Some were losing their jobs. Others were being put in prison, and he writes to them. He says, oh, you're going through suffering now, but look ahead to Jesus. Keep your eyes on him. And he begins this letter to these people that are sad and sorrowful. And he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you that they had something that the world couldn't touch. They had the living hope. They had Jesus. And nothing, no matter how great their sorrow was, nothing could take that joy or, or rob them of the joy of Jesus. And Peter goes on to say to them, your, your day of salvation, of deliverance, is coming. There's a day Jesus is coming again. And then he writes this to them in verses 6 through 8 of 1 Peter 1. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy, notice this, ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. These trials are testing your faith. Do you really believe what you believe? Is Jesus really in control? Does he really love you? It's testing your faith. And instead of getting out of the pool and saying, I'm not going to church, I'm not doing the whole Christianity thing, you move to the deep end. And Peter says your faith, it's being tested, but your faith is more precious than mere gold. In other words, God who sees you, what pleases him more than anything in his creation is you, you're the pinnacle of his creation, and your faith in him, believing him, taking him at his word, even when you're in that cave, that's precious to him. And Peter reminds them that there's coming a day when that faith will be rewarded. Sometimes as we go through life, we exercise faith and God rewards us and we're in the cave and then something good happens. But whether that happens or not, as we journey through life, as we're trusting him, there's coming a day when our faith will be rewarded. God always honors our faith. You never once in your life obey God and God's just casual about it and say, what, you know, well, good for you. He's like, that pleases me. So Peter writes to them, oh, you're experiencing sorrow now, but there's a day coming. Keep looking forward. And then he says this to them, verse 8, you love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. Does that describe you? That you haven't seen Jesus and you're experiencing sorrow, but you're trusting him and you love him and you've got this joy of Jesus that is inexpressible. It's hard to tell people exactly just how much he means to you and it's glorious, it's weighty, it's more important to you than anything. Is Jesus your treasure? Is he your portion? Is he your refuge? Is Jesus the one you're focusing on as you go through life? Because if he is, if that's the reality in your life, you will in time, when you acknowledge your sorrow, you'll just experience just a little of that joy that he wants to give you. And one day your faith will be turned to sight and you will be in a place of great joy. And if you're here today and you're not yet a follower of Jesus and you say, well, that sounds really nice, nice crutch, you know, you need Jesus to help you, okay. The reason that we are Christians here at Woodside, that we follow Jesus, yeah, he can help us get through things, but the reason we follow him 
is because he rose again on the third day. He came out of the tomb, out of the grave in history. And he says, I'm coming again. The grave's not the end. You will be with me in the palace forever and ever. Until that day, God has given us a wonderful gift to remind us because we're so prone to forget the blessings we have in Christ. He's given us a gift, the gift of the Lord's Supper to remind us that we are loved and to remind us that whatever we're going through is not the last word that God is.